IPM Hour. This episode is Organics Funding from USDA NIFA through the OREI program. Really excited to hear all about that. And the Southern IPM Hour uh, presents research issues and programs in integrated pest management from the Southern region. I'm Kayla Watson, the Communication Director for the Southern IPM Center. And we are one of four regional IPM centers supported by the USDA DIFA Crop Protection and Pest Management Regional Coordination Program. And we have a mission to coordinate IPM across the region. We're also housed at NC State and UGA. And uh, we are now accepting proposals for the Southern IPM grants. That deadline is coming up at the beginning of December, so you still have plenty of time to get that in if you're interested. But um, these grants regionally address global food security challenges, including invasive species, pest resistance, and impacts resulting from reg regulatory actions as well. We usually fund 12 to 13 projects and working groups per year at up to $30,000 per project and up to $40,000 per working group. And again, that deadline is December 3rd, and I will put um, a link to more information about that into the chat. As far as the webinar today, uh, we will be holding questions until the end, but if you have a question as we go throughout the webinar, you are free to type that into the Q&A and that's located on your Zoom control panel right across the bottom. Um, and we'll get to those after the presentation. And I want to say thanks to eOrganics and ATRA for getting the word out today about today's webinar. But our speaker today, very excited to have him with us is Dr. Matthew Guagio, and uh, Matt is the National Science, Science Liaison for Crop Production Systems at USDA NIFA. He represents NIFA primarily regarding programs related to plant production and protection, as well as organic farming. And prior to his National Science Liaison position, he served as a national program leader from 2013 to 2019 in the Institute of Food Production and Sustainability, where he administered competitive grant programs, including the Organic Transitions, the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, or AFRI, and the Organic Agriculture Research and Extension Initiative, the OREI, which he's gonna to talk to us about today. So thanks, Matt, for joining us, and we look forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you, Kayla. Uh, good afternoon to all. And thanks to uh, Roger and Joe for giving me the opportunity to join your team today uh, to discuss um, the information about our organic programs at NIFA. Um, here, let me share my screen with you and get started. Okay. Okay, do you see my screen now? Okay, should be in presentation mode now. Yeah, looks good. Okay. Okay, again, thank you, Kayla, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to be talking uh, about our funding opportunities for agriculture research and extension. Although I will focus on OREI, I will also talk a little bit about other programs that are relevant to organic agriculture here at NIFA. But before I start, I just wanted to go back and give a quick overview about uh, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, NIFA is the extramural science agency within the USDA. And we are part of the research, education, and economics mission area. And for some of you who don't know that, that's an emission area with five agencies. One of the agencies would be NEFA, the Agricultural Research Service, the Economic Research Service, the National Agricultural Statistics Service, and the Office of the Chief Scientist. So that is the mission area where NEFA is located within USDA. Uh, we do invest in and support initiatives that ensure the long-term viability of agriculture. NIFA provides funding and strategic leadership for programs that ensure break, groundbreaking discoveries in agricultural-related sciences and technology, 
and to make sure that those uh, discoveries reach the people who will put them into practice. And what are the different topics that we covered at NEFA? As you can see from this uh, slide, we cover a broad range of topics, ranging from advanced technologies or animal systems, business and economics. We have a full division focusing on education. And if you remember, we have so many uh, grants on education at NIFA. We cover the environment, we come out cover farming and ranching, and this is where the organic program will be located for our farming and ranching programs. We have a division of food science, health and nutrition. We cover human sciences, and we are investing more and more in that type of uh, research or initiatives. And as many of you also know, we, have a significant engagement in global uh, agriculture. However, most of our international activities are in support of domestic initiative because we do not want to compete with things like uh, United States uh, Aid for International Development. We have a division of natural resources and obviously we have a, a lot of programs that focus on plant systems, both production, and this is where you will see a lot of activities on pest management. So we cover a broad range of topics at NIFA. Now, how about agriculture, organic agriculture itself? Just a little bit of background about organic agriculture. It is one of the fastest growing segments of agriculture. Now, and if you look at the last couple of decades, uh, actually the last 10 years, we have seen a tremendous increase in organic agriculture throughout the whole country. If you would take an example of just from 2016 to 2019, the number of farms certified organic increased by 17%. The total sales of organic products increased by 31%, and the total amount or area of certified organic land increased by 9%. That is a significant increase for this industry. And this is not just here in the country. If you go to Europe, you will see exactly the same thing happening there. And most of that is powered by production and process. If you look at the graph on the left, the, the blue bar on top there represent uh, processed organic fruits and vegetables. And look at that increase between 1998 and 2016. That is impressive. If you look at the green bars, those will be processed organic meat uh, and meat product. The same thing applies there. And the red bars will represent organic wine, also increasing a lot over the last couple of years. And the graph on the right shows you uh, the number of registered organic farms in Europe. And again, from 1997 to 2015, we have a tremendous increase in those uh, registered organic farms. So now, if we, we have just seen that this industry is increasing a lot, however, now when you look at the investment by the major economies in terms of research and development, but most of that has be, remained flat, except for the German, where we can see a steady increase in the amount of money invested in research and development in organic agriculture. Look at the US here. It is very flat <laughs> uh, compared to other countries. Even Japan is investing way more in organic agriculture than here in the US. But as we go later in my presentation, you will see 
that the situation is probably about to change a little bit. So now let's go back to talk about NIFA organic program. What are we doing at NIFA to promote organic agriculture? So as we saw, the industry is growing, but for us to sustain that growth in the industry, we also need to invest in research and innovation. That is so critical if we want to keep that growth. A NIFA organic program have over the last 10 years have filled the gap by stimulating cutting edge research to address critical issues of the organic industry. Most of our programs, even if they do not specifically say organic, most of our programs are open to organic agriculture. These include both competitive and capacity program. However, we have two programs that are specific to organic agriculture. The one is the organic transitions, here ORG, and the second is organic agriculture research and extension initiative. We also have many programs, like I said earlier, that fund organic agriculture. I'm not going to go into the details here. One would be the AFRI program. Another one would be say, which have their own call from the region, just like the IPN centers. We have the beginning farmers and rancher program. And one program that a lot of people are not aware of is the critical agriculture research and extension care program. It's a relatively new program that fund project that combine research and extension. And that program has funded a lot of projects in organic agriculture. We also have the Specialty Crop Research Initiative, SCRI, and the Small Business Innovation Research. And obviously, we have a lot of capacity projects that fund organic agriculture. We also have many of our sisters' agencies that provide significant support for organic agriculture, either directly by doing the research themselves or through funding opportunities. That's where you have uh, like the Agriculture Research Service, ARS, the Economic Research Service, the Agriculture Marketing Service, that is where the specialty block grant is located. We got NRCS, the National Agriculture Statistics and the National Agriculture Library. We have so many other agencies within USDA that also provide significant support to organic agriculture. Now, to talk about those two programs that I talked, uh, told you that are specific to organic agriculture. One is the Organic Transition, ORG. The second is ORIA, Organic Agriculture Research and Extension Initiative. So the two programs are kind of a little different, but because again, as you can see here, the budgets are different, 7 million for ORG, 30 million in 2022 for ORBI. The scope of the programs are also different. The organic transition is focusing more on those who are adopting, who are still adopting or transitioning to organic systems, while OREI, focuses more on those, the issues of those who have already adopted and certified as organic producers. But where we see the biggest difference between the two programs is on eligibility. ORG is only open to colleges and universities, while ORAI is open to everyone, every US citizen, can apply to OREI. And eligibility is set by Congress. Sometimes we, there's nothing at NIFA that we can do to change that. To, to make any change on eligibility, you need to go back to Congress to do that. Now, what are the needs of those that end up with the organic system? And I will just say here that the organic industry is one of the most connected industries that I have worked with. They all work together, whether you are talking with farmers, uh, 
processors and the NGOs, they all work together as partners to identify their, their issues. And those challenges are very broad. And they do that by really having an active, active input on the farm bill. That is a group they have, they lobby a lot in DC to make sure that the need of the organic industry is part of the farm, every farm bill. They conduct national surveys, listening session meetings for input on how to improve or support the need of that industry. And like I said, that span the entire supply chain from all the production all the way uh, to the table. And what do we do at NIFA when we take all those needs of the industry? So we take all the priorities of the farmers and all the partners, we blend those priorities and the end product is the request for application that we publish every year. After that, we use a very strict panel review process to select projects that are funded. And our process or our selection is based mainly and only on scientific merits. After that, we spend a lot of time in post-award management to make sure that those projects or the PDs are doing the work or if they need support from us, we will be there to provide that stab of support. Now you will ask, what kind of project do we support? If the project is focusing on production efficiency, profitability, and making the industry more competitive, both programs will fund that. But the key here is, we want to see a little bit of overlap between the two programs, but if there's too much overlap, as you know, one of the program will run the risk of being terminated by Congress. Because of that, we tend to focus for the organic transition program, it tends to focus on ecosystem services of organic agriculture. We focus on developing tools that could be used by farmers or extension agents. It could be like bulletins, uh, IPM bulletin, things like that. We also look at products that are being phased out by the National Organic Program, NOP. Example would be like antibiotics, methionine for poultry production. So those are things, all two that are being phased out become our priorities in organic transitions. Now in OREI, which is where we focus on operating systems, it includes pretty much everything. And this is where we have to receive a lot of projects focusing on IPM, as you see there. For IPM in organic system, we usually recommend to go for ORI, unless that project is focusing on the transition to organic, how pests and diseases will uh, behave during that transition. We have also uh, been very lucky with these programs because uh, again, I told you the industry was very connected and because they are very connected, they have been very successful with uh, most of the farm bill. And this graph just show funding for the uh, ORAI program starting in 2004 with 3 million at that time and increasing to 20 million in 2009 and all the way to 2021, where we increased the budget to uh, 22 million. 2022, it's going to be 30 million. And 2023, the budget is going to increase to 50 million. And you may ask why 2013, there was nothing there. If you remember, that was the year with sequestration where many of our programs did not receive funding from Congress. But what I just wanted to show here is that Congress has been very generous to the organic uh, community. 
And again, look at ORAI funding. 2018 Farm Bill was a deal breaker, really. It increased our budget to 25 million in 2021, 30 million in 2022, 50 million in 2023, and beyond. So starting in 2023, we are going to have a budget of 50 million for research focusing on organic agriculture. Now you may ask what type of projects are funded by those two programs? The first one, ORAI, we have different type of project that we fund there. The first big group of project will be what we call the integrated projects. And we have the tier one, tier two, and tier three project each ranging from three to four years in duration. And the max, what is really the difference there is the maximum amount for each award. But that maximum award uh, should also reflect the scope of, the pro pro of each project. And if you look at the RFA, we have a full description of each of those uh, type of systems. We also, since two, uh, the 2014 Farm Bill, we have been funding curriculum development for organic agriculture with up to 750,000. And two of our tools that are very popular are the conference proposals and planning proposal for up to 50,000 50, each. And the planning proposal, we are one of the very few programs within NIFA that continue to support planning proposal. For the organic transition, we only have one type, project ranging from one to four years, 600,000 APs. So those are the different type of projects that we fund. Now, this is just going to go quickly on some of the statistics, how many projects we have received. I mean, over the years, starting, I would say ORIA started in 20, 2004. But before that, the ORG, the Organic Transition Program, started in 2001. The budget was just, I think, for 400,000 for the entire program. But look at the total number of projects that we have received over the years. So let's see here, big bump when we started ORAI. And then 2009, another big bump because the budget was increased to 20 million. So we are expecting probably next year to see another big bump when we go to $50 million. And the green bar represents the funded project. But another way of looking at this is the same data, but presented as cumulative number of proposal per year. And for a total close to 1,800 now, if we include the 2021, and out of those, we have funded 370 projects. So it's a program that is still very competitive. If you want to look at the success rate, if we lump the two programs together, we have an average of about 24% success rate, which is very good. If you look at our AFRI foundational program, some of the program have a success rate of less than 10 and if you look here, starting in 2001, we have a success rate of 75% because only four projects were submitted that year and three of them were funded. And I think each project was funded at $100,000 that year. But if you want to even dig deeper in the success rate of the program, with ORI being the blue bar and ORG being the green, we can see that. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the organic transitions tend to have a higher success rate, at least from the beginning. But here from 2015 to 2018, the two programs were very similar. And 2019, 20, and 21, once again, organic transition has a higher success rate because again, eligibility is very limited. I think that's part of the reason. So before I go to my next section here, I just wanted to show uh, some statistics uh, from the organic survey of 2019. If you want to look at the top states in organic farm, 
This are the one in green here. You can see they are mainly located on the West Coast and North Central and Northeast. Those are the top state in terms of organic farm. If you also look at the total organic sales in 2019, it shows the same picture, except that now we have Texas and North Carolina that come to the picture there. Now, if you look at the proposal that are submitted to our program, you can clearly see that the program is very national, even though it continues to show the same picture, a lot of projects coming from the West Coast, many from the North Central, and a lot from the North. But we have Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Texas, where we are receiving a lot of projects. If we look at the one that are funded, actually funded, again, we have the same picture. And this picture, uh, state here in pink are the ones that have not yet received anything from our, our program. The only difference is North Dakota, I think in 2021, received an award from the program. If you look at the total amount of money received by each of the state, again, same picture, West Coast, North Central, uh, Northeast, and now Florida, Texas uh, as the key. We have seen uh, a lot of change over the last couple of years. And for this program, we see more project funded in animal systems. We are seeing more minority and small institutions being funded. And also more importantly, we are seeing more awards going to the South. That was one of the preoccupation of the industry. And they wanted to see more uh, project funded in the South. Also, they wanted to see more project in plant or animal breeding. And this is what we are seeing here. Look at the success rate of uh, seed and breed project in green compared to the success rate of everything else in green. So starting 2015, the breeding project are having a higher success rate, which is what the industry wanted. Now, I just wanted to go quickly and show a couple of projects that are relevant to IPM that have been funded by this program. I'm not going to get into the details of the project, but this is just to show you that this is a possibility to support IPM research. Here, I'm showing projects funded in 2021 and 2020. This is one here from the University of Hawaii, funded this year in 2021, uh, focusing on sweet potato IPM. And they received 740,000 for that. We also, in 2020, uh, this year, university, uh, uh, Oregon State University received a project for electric weed control in perennial cropping systems. And it was over 2 million for that project. Same year, University of Florida received uh, about 2 million for uh, looking at essential oils and the potential to use that for controlling diseases in uh, fruit crops. But again, we see these are really very large award that this program is able to provide uh, to researchers. Going back to 2019, we have one the project from Cornell University focusing on foliar disease management in table beets industry. We have another one close to 2 million from North Carolina State University for pest management in organic sweet potatoes. Uh, 2018 was a very good year for uh, IPM or pest management for this program. We funded all these projects the same year. One was to look at uh, biological control strategies for Canada Tissel by Colorado Department of Art for over 300,000. 
uh, University of Georgia, and I was hoping that uh, uh, Ash will be here with us today to talk a little bit about this project that he received in 2018 to manage uh, spotted wing drosophila in, uh, production systems. That was two million. And I will also say he received another one of two million. That received two times uh, two projects of two million from our program. Same year we have one on weed management for so University of Maine. Uh, Montana State University was looking at uh, uh, weed management also. And the last one here was Clemson University was up with about 1 million looking at pest management in the South. So that's again, when we see projects that are funded in the South, we are very excited about that. In 2017 and 2015, we have a project from Cornell University by Brian focusing on onion, thrips, and stemphilium leaf, leaf blight, so insect and disease at, at the same time. We have another one by Ash, like I just said, that one was funded in 2015 for 2 million, looking at the same system here. In Cornell University with David Gaduri, we received 1.7 million uh, to look at uh, ways to suppress uh, pathogens using light manipulation in, in greenhouses. And Texas A&M uh, received also a project for pest management in Southern uh, Organic Rice in 2015. Here in 2014, 2012, we have a project from University of Illinois focusing on weed. You can see that a lot of project on, on weed and insect funded through this program. And David uh, Gaduri from Cornell received 50,000. What is cool here is he first received this project, 50,000 as a planning grant. And that allowed him to put together a full proposal that then was funded as 1.7 million. And we have another one here by Nelson that was funded at 2.6 million, looking also at an insect management and cropping system. And the last one by Cornell University was pet management in cucurbits. So these are just the couple of projects that are selected. In fact, I look at this last night, I just pick a couple of these just to show you that this program is really a place for funding uh, IPM research, as long as it is focused on organic. But you will also notice that many of the tools that are developed for IPM could be applied to either organic or conventional system. And as you all know, you saw that there's going to be a significant increase in the budget of the program. Moving to 50 million, we will be more than double our budget. So we will be looking for a lot of projects and we hope the scientific community is going to respond by submitting proposal to us. And this is going to be an opportunity to stimulate research and innovation and to tackle big challenges in organic production. We are looking some of the future things that we will continue to do will be to promote research and innovation. We'll also continue to explore new extension opportunities. So we, we are one of the few programs where we can actually fund extension only projects. Many other programs are more focusing on research, but here in the past we have funded extension only projects. And we will also continue to train the next generation of some of the things that we are hearing from our stakeholders is that we need to develop uh, smart tools for use by farmers and processors. Things like new seeds, natural substances or products for pest and disease management. We are hearing that we, they also need tools that will help them identify fake organic products to, you know, to increase the organic integrity. 
We also want to better understand the human dimension of organic agriculture and to make the, uh, the, the knowledge developed available to the end users who are farmers and consumers. Here, I just have a couple of resources that I put here near the end uh, of my presentation, just in case uh, Kayla decide to share this with, with you guys. In our contact information for NEFA Organic Program, it is myself in plant systems, uh, my colleague, Dr. Steve Smith, in animal systems. We have uh, Nirja, who is our new program specialist. And looking at the division director, we have John Erickson for plant system and Bob Godfrey for animal systems. So with that, I will stop there and take any questions that you may have. Let me also stop sharing my screen. Okay, back to you, Kayla, for any question. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, I definitely feel like I know a lot more about the program now than I did before. So thank you for that. Um, just as a reminder, if you do have a question, you can put it in the Q&A. Um, and at this point, I'm going to ask our co-directors of the Southern IPM Center um, to also speak for a moment. So we have uh, one co-director based at NC State, and that's Roger McGarry. And then we have the other co-director, Joe LaForest, who is located at UGA. Oh, I just uh, thank you, Kayla. First of all, I just wanted to thank Matt uh, for uh, just giving us this overview. I really like all the graphs, and it's exciting to see the, uh, the opportunities that are going to be ahead. And um, I definitely know that organic production in warm climates is can be very very challenging due because of uh, pest pressure. So I think uh, we've got the uh, challenges uh, ahead. I think one thing that's exciting is the opportunity for planning uh, planning grants. I really uh, appreciate the um, the example you gave of Dave Bedori's research. How I was able to take a fifty thousand um, dollar planning grant and, and convert that into a uh, you know two million dollar grant. Uh, you know, uh, Joe's going to expand on some of the um, response, uh, some of the tools and resources our center has. But just wanted to uh, just put this out there: if you have ideas uh, for, you know, potentially for a planning grant, especially in the South, maybe put that into the chat or, or um, ask a question because that's something that our center um, can definitely help with: is that kind of uh, networking and bringing uh, bringing people together, you know, for a conference grant or a, or a planning grant. But I'll uh, just hand it over to Joe, who's going to give a rundown of some of the services and support that our, our Southern Center can provide. Thanks, Roger. So you, the Southern IPM Center is funded by USDA NIFA under a program Matt didn't get into because it's not fully organics, but under the Crop Protection and Pest Management uh, grant program they have. And with that, the Regional Coordination Program has four centers in the U.S. that are meant to work within our regions and between regions to help pull people together and, if possible, provide some common tools and resources to prevent people from reinventing the wheel, provide some longevity for products between grants. Um, I think most of us who have been on that grant merry-go-round know the ebb and flow of the grant programs. Um, so the Southern IPM Center has had a special emphasis on this with the technology we provide that we host at this point, I believe we're up around 25 different websites for different folks for I think three or four of the SCRI projects where their web host, we make sure they have a place that's going to be stable between grants. Um, we also provide a number of tools like, um, Part of what I do at University of Georgia is also the Bugwood Network. So all the tools we have there for the image database with 350,000 pictures of the good, the bad, and the ugly in agriculture we have available for folks as outreach tools. We've got EdMaps, an ag pest monitor. So if you're trying to either get a hold of an invasive species to know where it is, and pull that data together, get people reporting it through citizen science, pull that data in through monitoring programs. We work with folks and all those tools are provided for free. Well, rather I should say they're not free. They're covered under the 
Regional Coordination Program for the Southern Region. That small tech supplement that's that we are provided by NIFA allows us to sustain those services and offer them to anybody that wishes to use them. So we work with a lot of different folks from spotted wing drosophila, cucurbit downy mildew, you name a pest that's come in recently, we have a ways for people to coordinate those efforts to say where it is and, and provide a consistent message to all partners, figure out how to integrate that into their websites. We also do a lot just for coordination of meetings, helping to host webinars like this. A lot of it is the technology that we try to help those biologists out so they don't have to be a tech person as well. Um, we've actually got a website that goes into some of the offerings we have. I'm dropping, actually, Kayla's beat me to it. She's already got it in the chat. So if you see any of that, how we operate with most folks that write grants, they tell us what we want. they want to do. I write a very nice letter of commitment saying, yes, we have talked to them. They have asked for these resources. And here's what we're going to make sure is available to them at no cost to their project through the Southern IPM Center. So if that's something that would interest you in any project, organic or not, we're happy to help you with that. Back to you, Roger. Thank you, Joe. Uh, let's just see if there's any questions for um, for Matt. Let's start off with questions for Matt. And I know that you can either uh, put your question in the chat or you can raise your hand and uh, Ka um, Kayla will let you have the microphone. And while waiting for that, uh, Roger, I just wanted to also uh, say that the, the RFA, the request for application for those programs will be coming soon. Right now, we, we were hoping to get it by the 15th of this month, but hopefully by the end of the month, those RFAs will be published for the 2022 funding cycle. And applicant will have a minimum we don't know yet, but a minimum of two months. Could go all the way to three or four months, but that would be a minimum of two months to respond to those RFAs. And we do not expect to see major changes. You know, award size are still going to be around uh, 3 million for ORAI and around 600,000 for uh, ORG, the organic transitions. And I am going to go ahead um, and put up a small poll if you wouldn't mind to take it for us. Um, and this just helps us know how we did with the webinar as a whole and to make sure that we are um, giving you what you need. So if you could fill out, it's just four questions. Two of them are yes and no. Um, and I'll give you a, a few minutes to do that. And um, Roger or Joe, do you have any questions for Matt? I think Matt did a great job explaining the programs and where organics fits into USJ NIFA's portfolio. There's a lot of great stuff being done there. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I appreciate the list of additional resources. I didn't uh, get a chance to look at that, but um, you know, this session is being recorded. So um, just please do pass uh, information on to your colleagues and you'll be able to pause that slide showing all those additional resources. And I think that's gonna be uh, helpful information. I don't know if we could get those links out um, in a newsletter or something to Kayla, so they'll be maybe clickable and stuff like that. Um, but we'll look at look at ways to get that out to people as well, if that's okay, Matt. Okay. And uh, one thing that I wanted to also uh, talk about, Roger, would be, a uh, organic IPM is really, really popular. When I sit on those review panels, each time you see a project that is focusing on IPM, I mean, everyone would be excited about that project because that, those are addressing some of the key 
needs of the industry. Pest and disease management in organic agriculture is really uh, a, a problem. And most of the IPM strategies, whether you are dealing with uh, organic or conventional systems, we, we, we use the same, uh, sometimes the same strategy. So I would just strongly encourage people in organic, in IPM, to consider looking into organic systems as well. Thanks, Matt, for the encouragement. I think it's I think it's definitely a challenge, and so I think that's the encouragement is um, is really valuable. I'll throw in the in the chat. There's a link to NIFA's upcoming RFA calendar. They've done a great job of keeping that up to date, and I love having early notice for when I should expect stuff to come out. NIFA has a great newsletter that you can subscribe to. Um, if you're paranoid like I am about occasionally, you know, did I miss something coming out? I'm dropping the link in for the Southern IPM Center newsletter. Kayla does a great job of making sure everybody knows about any funding opportunity that's out there. So if you want to subscribe to that, we'll make sure it goes right to your inbox and you're up to date when the new RFAs come out. Never hurts to get that more than once, especially when it's these great programs. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll go just ahead. drop the link in for uh, future topics. We're very interested in your ideas for future topics. One other plug, uh, if you did have um, uh, resources uh, that you want that you know, resources uh, for organic uh, research, particularly in IPM. If you have resources, please let us know about that. That's something that we can share with the West, uh, with the rest of the region. And I did notice that we also had Trevor on uh, the call from the Organic um, Organic Research Foundation. Trevor, I, I don't know if you just wanted to say hi. I'm not, I was not even aware of your research foundation. So that's a resource that uh, I think the, um, the people on the call might be interested in hearing about uh, at some stage. Okay, so yeah, so it's good to it's good to have this networking, and I appreciate I just certainly appreciate everybody uh, turning up, and and please, uh, please you know please spread the word about this uh, this program. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, we we do work very closely with the Organic Farming Research Foundation, and we do work very closely with E Organic and many of those. Uh, uh, we call them actually key partners because uh, everything we do we we do with them, so. Good to see that they are also a uh, part of this webinar. Great. Well, I want to say thanks again um, to our speaker today, Matt Guadillo from NIFA, and uh, to our co-directors, Roger McGarry and Joe LaForest. Our next IPM hour is going to be on the first Wednesday of the month, like always, December 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern. And if you want to find out more information about the Southern IPM Center, you can visit us at southernipm.org. And have a great day.